I have glad that uh, we are having a uh, Leland to the, from uh, the company called Sync to talk about how to securing the open source uh, supply chain. So um, maybe we we heard uh, we heard a lot about the supply chain new system, but what exactly the API supply chain uh, is? I think uh, this is something that the the audience here would would like really like to learn about. So uh, let's uh, feel free to uh, welcome uh, Leland here. Okay. Hello. Hi, oh, yes. hey, Patrick. Okay, I, lo I love your head. <laughs> okay, it's nice to meet you. Okay, so your, your voice is loud and clear, so maybe you try to share your screen here. Yep, there we go. Yeah, I think this is good. So uh, maybe let me pass the time to you, and then uh, I think the, the cow really uh, would like to love uh, from you about what is the uh, supply chain of API. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. So hi everyone, my name is Liran Tal. I'm a developer advocate at Sneak, where we build open source uh, packages and the world of open source security in a secure way. Thank you for having me and for joining my talk today. Are we forever doomed by software supply chain security risks? Now, as you look at this picture, let's take a moment to reflect what are you actually seeing here? When, when you look at this photograph, what comes to your mind? Is it a futuristic outlook of the future? Is it the futuristic out of the world? Is it maybe the robots are going to control all of us and the uprising of our robot overloads is coming? For me, I ask myself, how much does the robot know and learns about my child? And where is this information stored? Is it stored in a safe manner, in a safe place? Where is it actually stored? I think about things like, where does the robot here get its software updates from? And wherever it gets them from, can that source be compromised? What, what happens if that data and all of that information is compromised at some point? What is actually saved in that cloud maybe? Well, even more, what's the probability of someone hacking in and can watch the video feed and maybe talk to my child? All of those things in that, you know, seeing a robot with a picture interacting, which is maybe a nice thing, are coming to my mind when I sleep at night. This is what I'm thinking about. The security of all of those things, Internet of Things, everything is now connected. And as you look at maybe amazing futures like that, we have some concerns to reason about. So today I would like to share with you this real world stories, how developers play a fundamental role in the recent and growing security, security incidents that we're seeing. Secondly, why should you care about software supply chain security? How is that affecting your life day to day? And finally, I wanna leave you off to think about, well, where do you put your trust? Who do you trust? What does it mean when you trust those people, organizations, that system? <clears throat> so to get us started, in 1984, the Turing award-winning Ken Thompson wrote a short essay titled Reflections on Trusting Trust. In this paper, he describes how he added the backdoor to the Unix login program. But then he continued and added the backdoor to the C compiler. And then he continued and added the backdoor and this chain of attack of backdooring, he actually added the backdoor to the compiler that compiles the compiler. This all relates together because in his revelation of how software can be taught to learn specific traits, and then pass them on to their response, he explains how software can remain without a trace of a Trojan horse because of the dangers of basically us trusting code that we did not entirely create ourselves. Ken, Ken went further and, and amplified amplify this completely from anything from the application code to, co to anything else that we did not write ourselves, the compiler, the assembler, the keyboard, the mouse, the screen. What is it presenting? Is it something that I trust? So as we learned from Thompson's Trojan horse story dating back to 1984, developers have been targeted as a vehicle to distribute malware and backdoors for a very long time now. And <clears throat> let's explore next some more recent events. For example, in 2018, the JavaScript ecosystem witnessed its first high impact spearheaded surgical attack targeting maintainers and developers alike working in open source and themselves being used as an attack vehicle to distribute malicious JavaScript code 
designed to decrypt itself and run in a specific environment. It was actually targeting developers of a Bitcoin wallet application because this was running in the wild. It was running as an open source project where you could learn how the project works, learn how the developers build things, and then see where you need to inject yourself into that process. And this is how you hack your software supply chain of a specific targeted uh, attack. This was the well-known event stream incident. Event stream existed on the NPM registry since 2011. This is gonna, what I'm going to walk you through that incident and exactly what happened. And this really tells the story of open source supply chain security. This event stream open source package did not receive any new releases in the last two years of this incident, but it gained millions of downloads per week. Out of the blue, so something just happens. A person shows up on the GitHub repository one day, opening an issue and wanting to help, as is customary in open source. They further contribute code with several pull requests, and then they also create a pull request that adds a dependency into event streams, own package dependency tree, with supposedly genuine intent to improve the code base for event stream. But a few weeks later, they add a code payload to that dependency that they added, which injects malware, and that ended up in a specific Bitcoin wallet application called Copay, because that Copay wallet application used event stream as part of its build process. What is happening now is that this is part of the release of the Copay app actually on the users and on the mobile devices. This whole incident, this whole event stream security incident had gone unnoticed for almost three months, resulting with two versions released of the Copay Bitcoin wallet app and included the malware. This is a social engineering attack in open source, in the open, where everything, everyone could look at it, but it had kind of noticed for three months. An academic research paper published in 2019 investigated the properties of language-based software ecosystems. What it found was that 61% of open source packages on NPM, NPMJS, the largest, probably the largest open source uh, repository for application dependencies in the world, it found that it has 61% of packages that could be considered abandoned. Abandoned, maybe unsupported, because maybe they did not receive any release in the prior 12 months. And as if we didn't learn anything from the event stream incident, one year later, a similar thing happens. The electronative notify incident took place. What happened, you ask? Okay, so let's go through this. At one point in time, an existing version of Electronative Notify has no malware in it. This is just fine, but a user adds it to a dependency tree of a popular package, of a different package. They build one package and they add it as a dependency of a different one. Then that user releases a new version of that Electron package, which now includes the malware. And the result is that when the new Agama crypto wallet is being built, it is actually including this upstream dependency of the, the version of the malware, having the malware in that, in that application. If it sounds familiar, this is exactly what happened with event stream. Social engineering attack, malicious incidents happening on the open source supply chain security affecting all of us. <clears throat> if we take a different route, let's see what happens in the mobile space. So this is a sneak-led security research in the CocoaPods mobile applications ecosystem. It identified malware in this SDK for ad networks called the Mintegral Ad SDK. This Mintegral mobile SDK is used for advertising attribution for mobile applications and was downloaded more than 1.2 billion times a month. It is integrated into thousands of applications. These are downloads for all of us, right? Me, you, everyone that uses mobile application might have downloaded an app that uses this SDK behind the scenes by the developer, by the company built them to actually do adver advertising attribution. So this is all downloaded from the official app store. But what Sneak found was interesting because this SDK had proprietary obfuscated pieces of code that they were hooked into sensitive and careful system APIs on the mobile device, which shouldn't really happen with you know, many co uh, you know, common cases. So this alerted a potential suspicious behavior. What did it actually do? What did we observe this mobile SDK doing? Well, first of all, it was intercepting all of those HTTP network traffic for some reason. 
it av we avoid the detection. So when the SDK detects debuggers or jailbroken devices, it it quietly you know goes behind the scenes and doesn't do anything too bad. And lastly, Sneak found that this SDK actually installs a backdoor used as a command and control instance for someone who wants to control the device remotely. This is kind of mind blowing how all of those applications, open source and mobile are impacting us, but how much thought are we giving to the security of our own development infrastructure? Resources like your cloud instances, your staging environments, your CIs and build and continuous integration tooling. How much are you thinking of whether you're using a tool like that? What, what could go wrong there? So in January, 2021, this is you know very recent incident, a security researcher broke into Microsoft's Visual Studio Code GitHub repository. It essentially, this incident <laughs> provided him with the capability of making code modifications to the popular and very well loved IDE VS Code that many developers use. This happened because of a command injection flow that was made possible because of a valid attack vector of a flawed regular expression. All of this coming together, basically allowing an opening by, by opening a new code pull request, the researcher was now able to execute code that the VS Code CI, the, the continuous integration scripts were running without requiring any sort of authentication or authorization checks on who was who were running those, uh, those that called pull request. What happened is that this led to remote reverse shells on these CI servers and from there the ability to gain push and write access to the repository's source code. Fortunately, the researcher responsibly reported this flaw and Microsoft, you know, for the whole thing before advanced threat actors could exploit it. So how much do we know about the current state of open source security and what it entails, what it takes from us, from every one of this, every one of us citizens of open source? In an effort to explore the security awareness of the Python and the, Java, the JavaScript open source communities, a group of researchers investigated how maintainers work in the open source community with regards to their ability to mitigate security vulnerabilities. One of the research questions was, how quickly do open source maintainers mitigate a new published, a new published security vulnerability? The research found that it takes about 100 days on average for both of these ecosystems, both JavaScript and Python maintainers, to start mitigating, right? Start fixing or attending to a public vulnerability that is now known, that is a CVE report was, was created for. Now ask yourself, is this fast enough for you as a consumer of a library to basically wait those that, that amount of time until a fix is made available? If we examine the number of commits that mitigate a vulnerability out of the total number of commits that we can see that Python, for example, has a more consistent track of security mitigation, whereas in the JavaScript community, it was largely inactive in this regard until 2018. If nothing else, this demonstrates the low levels of AppSec awareness around the JS open source community in those early, early years before 2018. As a case study, we can refer to Marked's own security vulnerability from several years back. Marked is a markdown parser for the web. It is downloaded millions of times a week. It is one of the most popular libraries for this purpose of building those kind of things in the JavaScript and the Node.js ecosystem. But one day, a security researcher opened a code pull request, again, on the repository, which reports and fixes an XSS vulnerability, a cross-site scripting vulnerability that exists within the Markdown library. This pull request included tests for future code regressions and proof of concept of how this vulnerability could be exploited. This is happening all in the wild. As is with open source software though, maintainers are you know, really just trying to do their best, right? They, they can't be there for you all the time. There are no legal or contracting obligations for maintainers to support you with any sort of fixes or a feature, a feature request. So this vulnerability was left out in the open with no fix for a year. This security issue and proposed code fix was opened in 2015, but was only merged and released as a version that is available to upgrade to with a fix only a year later in 2016. Now, when we're all so very much dependent on open source software, we can't ignore the question of 
where do we put our trust? And what our mitigations and security controls to cope with the risks involved? In 2017, a security researcher working with the Node.js Foundation conducted a research in which he wanted to assess the state of weak NPM credentials used by maintainers. His work revealed the devastating truth of developers' lack of security hygiene, even maintainers, not ordinary developers, the day-to-day -day consumers. So the security researcher was able to gain published access to 14% of NPMJS ecosystem modules. Some of these modules are downloaded tens of millions of times a week and are an essential and key part of this thriving JavaScript ecosystem. But the problem was really rooted with the fact that those maintainers and developers building and maintaining open source software and packages on NPM were actually you know, using insecure passwords insecure account hygiene for, for, their, for their accounts on NPM, which has resulted in account takeovers. So some of these you know, well-known uh, passwords was the word password, literally the word password that was giving access to publish for an account that had millions of downloads for their packages. This is a bit of insane that we need to understand what is going on with open source security and how the supply chain, how all of us are basically a part of this. If our code packages can reach millions of developers, shouldn't we have more protections in place? As citizens of the open source community, can we do better for our own account security hygiene? NPM, the largest registry of open source packages spanning more than 1.5 million packages to date, has supported two-factor authentication since the end of 2017. This is already four years ago now. So four years ago, we had two-factor authentication already supported on the NPM registry, which allows us to better equip the security of our accounts. Despite all of those security incidents and compromised accounts happening throughout those recent years in 2018, in 2019, in 2020, in, let's look at what happened there. In 2019, only 7.1% of NPM packages, of NPM package maintainers have been able to FA, only 7.1%. Unfortunately, the software supply chain security story is not resonating enough with developers, which is why we're here talking about it and making the required awareness on this. Because in 2020, 2FA enabled accounts have only grown by merely 2% to approximately 9% of the entire developer accounts on NPM. So less than 10% four years later have enabled 2FA. As cybersecurity expert Bruce Schneer said in his book, Security Secrets and Lies, Humans often represent the weakest link in the chain. A term, a different term coined, by, uh, coined as Linus's law back in 1999 by Eric Raymond in his work, The Cathedral and the Bazaar, in which he explored the differences between software development as executed within an open source disorganized movement, if so to say, and that of enterprises, which are formally organized companies. Eric stated that given a large number of developers and users, software flaws could be quickly identified. Really? Let's take a look. In January 2021, it was discovered that sudo, a common utility installed in many Linux distributions, has a security vulnerability. Specifically, any unprivileged user can gain root access just based on the default sudo configuration. What is so daunting about this vulnerability is that despite having all of those eyeballs, people looking at open source, this security vulnerability was hiding in plain sight for a decade, for a whole 10 years. No one maybe knew about it until someone reported it 10 years later. Open source registries, as another example, are open in their nature and allow developers to openly push code packages into them. But what happens when maintainers remove their dependencies out of the registry? This is a different aspect of open source supply chain security related with the, the amount of resiliency an organization has. This is exactly the story of what happened in 2016 when a maintainer named Azure pulled tens of his open source packages from NPM. But one of them, just one of them, what happened to be a pivotal package in this ecosystem. 
and failing to download it now would have resulted in widespread breakage of continuous integrations installation processes because they relied on this open source package, maybe not directly, perhaps indirectly, but now it's unavailable and all of those builds and, and code uh, uh, building processes are now broken because of this. At the very least, this incident showed us two things. First of all, the weakness and you know, in unresiliency that businesses have, you know, and how they fail to manage their open source software in general. This 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 incident exposed that soft spot. Secondly, is how registries themselves they they did not foresee this as a problem, and so they were not designed to handle this circumstance of a maintainer pulling down their packages. Can we really deny that being a part of, of the open source ecosystem? As consumers, maybe some of us are contributors, others are possibly maintainers of open source software. We all play a part in a world where 90% of our application code is made up of open source components. What kind of malicious activities and assets can we track back to open source ecosystems? Time after time, we find more and more malicious packages hitting the NPM JS ecosystem. If you accidentally installed one of these packages by perhaps typo squatting mistake, maybe you typoed the wrong package and received an installation of a malicious package, or maybe someone was adding that malicious package into your dependency tree without you knowing it because they added it to like indirect package that is somewhere down the tree and you may not be tracking all of that. Your chances, your chances of basically finding this with the growth of open source packages is insane. Malicious packages aren't just a thing on the JavaScript ecosystem. We are iterating that as examples, but this is hitting other packages and, and language ecosystems. On March 2021, more than 3,000 malicious packages were published on the PyPI registry. To further show us how attackers can harness open source to their advantage, Alex Birshan published his research in February 2021, again, a recent incident about how we exploited, how he exploited design flaws in package managers along with registries and human error to infiltrate into corporations such as Apple and Microsoft and others. Highly recommend reading that article because I would like to leave you with the following questions to think upon. Are we going to have less or more software in the future? Where are we heading? Where is technology headed? Are we going to use less or more open source software? Are we growing in, the, in our open source software consumption and creation or are we decreasing our amount of it? And finally, who do you trust? Who do you trust when you use open source? Who do you trust when you use anything else? Where do you put that trust? Thank you for joining my talk. I am Liran Tal, a developer advocate at Sneak, where we build a security platform to help developers build securely with open source software. Thank you all for joining and uh, taking it back to you, Patrick. Hello, yeah, hello, Leon. So uh, yeah, this one, I think I, I really, really are interested on this one because uh, this is our daily um, issues, I would say. So I think back to our old days, uh, we handle the library, we download the library and do the security scanning on our own. And then once the, the open source, we are using more module, then uh, we, we actually have a uh, lot of feeling. Okay, how can I we how can we control uh, this kind of thing? So uh, this is a really, really uh, good sharing uh, to us. So uh, let me try to check some of the questions uh, from the audience. Um, okay, so uh, we, I think you have shared quite a lot of incidents and also uh, your company is very experienced in handle those things. So um, do we have any, any uh, maybe one or two um, uh, quick recommendations maybe for, for people if uh, they are actually starting their own uh, pilot project exactly? What is the day one recommend, recommendation for you uh, for them to start their own uh, 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 day one projects? Any, any quick recommendation for them? Yeah, so I think what I, what I'd like to be able to help people, like you know, you know, put security on, if so to say, is first of all understand that security on by default is really important because otherwise it it gets you know forgotten, it's it's not getting accounted for, and so on. So when you start a new project, think about monitoring that project, running security scans on it. There are a lot of tools, you know, Sneak is one of them, but there are others if you wanted to you know try it out. Put all the 
amount of uh, not security gates, but uh, mm -hmm. paved road, right? Like you could add an integration of Sneak that when you have a, a pull request coming in, it checks from the SEA, from the open source sort of um, um, angle of it, that the packages that were added to the project do not have any vulnerabilities in them. It checks that there aren't any licensing issues. Um, if you have a Docker file added in, you check that the you know the, the container image is is you know it is clear of vulnerabilities or you know have a low amount of them. So there are all of those checks that you could add that are as the security is on by default is helping you and giving you this paved road of you know this is this is keeping us in check while allowing the developers team to you know move fast uh, you know in in a sane manner. And also I'd like to like bring it down like to a practical advice. So. There are a lot of uh, like sort of cheat sheets and best practices that we write on the sneak blog that if you, you know, if someone wanted to go in and there's like Java security best practices and NPM security best practices and all of those things where we tell you, right, like enable 2FA. Uh, when you install packages, have, uh, have specific uh, NPM CLI tags that would uh, cause the installation to not run arbitrary commands by the packages. So like they could not steal your tokens or things like that. So you know there there are, there are more, but I would say you know co uh, consult those best practices um, uh, on the on the Snake Chichit's blog or somewhere else to basically find and, and work towards uh, establish those uh, common security best practices and patterns of how to do things in a secure way. Mm, thank you, thank you. So I I think that the audience should want to ask more questions, but um the time is uh, almost up. So uh, maybe uh, you can also leave your contact in the chat room so that people can also reach you out. So uh, we defend for our time, uh, Ian. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Patrick. Soon.